Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking time from your evening to join us for this webinar. We're really pleased to be able to offer tonight's program, Dystonia in Children and Adolescents, with our speaker, Dr. Jonathan Mink. My name is Janet Hyshutter, and it's my great honor to serve as the Executive Director for the DMRF and to welcome you all tonight. This webinar will be recorded and placed on our website for future reference. Just a couple of things to make sure that we're all in the right mode for the webinar. As you may have noticed in your reminder email, there are two options for listening to the audio portion of tonight's webinar. The voice over IP, which uses your computer speakers, or via the telephone. Please make sure that the correct option is chosen in the audio panel of your attendee control panel. If you have chosen to use the telephone, please be sure to enter the audio pin provided to you and to turn down the speakers on your computer. Your questions are an important part of this program and we encourage you to write them down and send them through as you think of them and we'll do our best to address all of them in the time that we have. Those questions also help to serve and to identify topics for articles in the dialogue in the future. So if we don't get to everyone's question, make sure you tune into the dialogue for, for answers to those questions. We will take the written questions at the end of the presentation and these will be moderated by me. If you have any technical difficulties during the webinar, please email Jody Roosevelt at J-R-O-O-S-E-V-E-L-T at dystonia-foundation.org. That's J Roosevelt at dystonia-foundation.org, and she will assist you. So now on to our program. The DMRF was founded nearly 40 years ago by two parents, Fran and Sam Belsberg, who were motivated by what was happening to their then teenage daughter, Sherry. The Bellsbergs are still actively involved parents working to not only help their daughter, Sherry, but the thousands of others who are affected by dystonia. The DMRF's mission is to support research that will lead to more effective treatments and ultimately to a cure, to support awareness and education, and because we know that research does not move fast enough for those who are waiting, the DMRF is committed to providing support for those who are affected and their families. We take our responsibility to provide accurate information very seriously, and the DMRF is proud of the resources we have to provide the community. Tonight we are privileged to have one of the preeminent pediatric neurologists as our speaker for this webinar. Dr. Jonathan Mink is Chief of Child Neurology, Vice Chair of Neurology, and a professor in the Neurology, Neurobiology, and Anatomy, Brain and Cognitive Sciences, and Pediatric Departments at the University of Rochester Medical Center in Rochester, New York. His research focuses on the function of the basal ganglia to select desired movement patterns, movement disorders, and pediatric neurodegenerative diseases. Dr. Meek also recently hosted a conference on musicians' dystonia, an area that also greatly interests him. He, received, he has received numerous awards recognizing his achievements in clinical practice, the laboratory, and as a mentor. Dr. Meek earned his BA in biology psychology from Westland University and his MD and PhD in neurosciences from Washington University. He has served on the DMRS Medical and Scientific Advisory Board, has been a big supporter of the Dystonia Toss for Dystonia event that's held in Rochester every year, and we're very pleased to have him with us tonight. Dr. Mink. Thank you very much. Need just a moment to get the slides set here. Okay, so I'm going to be talking tonight uh, about Dystonia in children and adolescents. Um, I'm going to start by defining what we're talking about talk about some of the uh, clinical features that help us distinguish dystonia from other disorders of movement, talk a little bit about what uh, physicians think about when uh, considering diagnostic options, and then close by talking about some treatment strategies. So what is dystonia? Dystonia is a movement disorder, and it's a movement disorder that's characterized by abnormal muscle contractions that produce abnormal postures or movements or a combination of sustained postures and movements. The movements are typically patterned. What that means is if you look at someone who has dystonia, you tend to see the same movement in that individual uh, occurring again and again. 
They're typically twisting, but not always, and there may be tremor or shaking associated with the dystonia. In many people with dystonia, when they're completely at rest, they don't have any dystonia. In others, uh, it's milder at rest than when they're trying to make uh, voluntary movements. And very often, movements are accompanied by what we often call overflow muscle activation or activation of muscles that would not normally be active in that, uh, in that task or that activity. I'm going to start by showing a video. This is a girl who has uh, dystonia. Her particular cause of dystonia was a stroke, and the stroke uh, occurred on the left side of her brain. Uh, injury to one side of the brain tends to produce problems on the opposite side of the body. She's seven years old. You'll see while she's sitting here and being asked to do some things we do as part of our standard neurologic exam. When she starts out, her right arm and hand and foot look pretty normal. Her movement may be a little bit more deliberate than you'd expect in a seven-year-old, a little slower, but notice now when she moves the left side, what happens to the right? And that's a characteristic uh, finding in, in many people with dystonia is the dystonia, uh, the body part affected by dystonia gets worse when they're making movements of other parts of the body. And you'll see in a moment here what happens with her right leg and foot as she taps her thumb and forefinger on the affected side. So notice she's slow there, but the more she tries, the more twisting she gets in that leg. The other thing about dystonia is very often the problem is not producing the movement that one wants to make, it's turning off the muscles that make that movement. So you'll notice that as she gets her right uh, hand and fingers in a particular position, it's difficult for her to relax that. And so here she'll make a fist, and then to open the finger, she actually has to use the other hand to help. She's not prying them open. She's lightly touching them, but does require uh, a stimulus there to help her relax those muscles. So that's really the example of what, what the, the main features of dystonia are. There's abnormal muscle contraction that leads to abnormal postures and movements that have a twisting quality. Very often, the dystonia is brought on by attempted movement of the affected body part, but may be brought on by movement of uh, other body parts as well. Now, there are a couple of features of dystonia that help us neurologists distinguish them from other kinds of movement disorders. One is something that we refer to as task specificity. So very often, the dystonia occurs only with certain movements and not with other movements, even though they say they may use the same muscles. So writer's cramp is an example, and this is one of the more common forms of dystonia that starts in adulthood, but it happens in children as well with a variety of kinds of dystonia where there may be difficulty writing, but not typing, for example, or not playing the piano or feeding oneself. Uh, if there's involvement of the speech or the voice, there may be difficulty talking, but less difficulty singing or whispering. And then many children who have uh, dystonia that involves multiple body parts may have more difficulty walking forward than they do backward, for example, or may have trouble walking but no tr trouble running or even swimming. Each individual varies in the degree and the nature of this task specificity, but there's usually some aspect of, um, of uh, the dystonia that affects certain actions more than others. Now, the other characteristic clinical feature of dystonia is what we call the sensory trip or the geste antagoniste. And this is lightly touching one part of the body that may relieve the spasms. So in the video of the little girl I showed, you notice that when she got her hand clenched together, if she lightly touched that hand with her left hand, it helped her relax her fingers. And there are many, many examples that have been uh, reported uh, people who have dystonia that forces their jaw closed may find that if they put a straw or a toothpick in their mouth, it helps them open their mouth more easily. People who have twisting of their neck or uh, other types of abnormal postures or movements of their neck may find that lightly touching the side of their chin could help. And people with writer's cramp uh, may find that rubbing the back of their hand can help or even changing the size or the shape of the pen that they used to write with. And again, there are 
each individual has their own types of sensory tricks. I'll show you another video a little bit later that, that, uh, that uh, displays this as well. So how is, di is dystonia diagnosed? There are many different disorders that can affect movement. Uh, there can be weakness. There can be cramping from other causes. There can be trouble with the nerves uh, going out to the muscles. And so the first step is to really find out uh, what we can learn about the history of the disorder. When did it start? How has it changed over time? What parts of the body are affected? What types of activities are most impacted by the dystonia? And then we do a careful neurological examination with a focus on control of movement, but we examine every part of the nervous system. For movement disorders, we really have to see the abnormal movements. Some forms of dystonia are what we call paroxysmal dystonias, or those that may only occur for a few seconds every day, or multiple episodes, but just for a few seconds. And sometimes in the neurologist's office, we don't get to see the abnormal movements, and that can sometimes be difficult. And so uh, if the neurologist can't see the movements, we usually ask for a video uh, so that we can see what the movements look like and when they occur. And then after seeing the movements, after learning about how they evolved and, um, and how they impact uh, uh, one's life, then there may be specific tests that we will order to help diagnose the specific cause of the stony. So again, some of the key questions that we, we ask is, when did they start? How old was the, uh, uh, how old was the patient? How have they changed over time? Have they changed over time? What body parts are involved? Is it the entire body? Is it one side of the body? Is it just one uh, joint or one muscle group? Are these movements continuous? Do they happen all the time or are they intermittent? Do they come and go? And then very importantly, are there other findings when we do a neurological exam or when we ask about other symptoms, are there symptoms or findings on our examination that make us think of specific causes? or uh, point to other abnormalities that might lead to a very specific diagnosis. How do they change? Does cold make things worse? Does being hot make things worse? How do emotional states uh, modulate the movement disorder? Does stress and anxiety make things worse? Does relaxing or sleeping uh, make things better? And then very importantly, because many causes of dystonia are genetic, is there a family history of something similar or potentially related? And then, of course, we want to know what makes things better and what makes things worse, because not only can that be a clue as to what is the cause, but it can be an important clue about things we can do to help the individual with dystonia function better. So our first step is to classify it. Uh, as we'll uh, see in the next few slides, uh, there are many, many, many causes of dystonia, well over a hundred different causes of dystonia. And so to make sense of this, uh, neurologists will, will very often try to classify it based on two primary uh, means. One is uh, based on clinical characteristics, and we'll go through a little bit of that. And then we want to classify based on etiology, meaning what causes it. Many of you have probably heard the term primary dystonia and the term secondary dystonia. We've used those over many years to distinguish those that either are pure dystonia or are caused by things that we can't identify. And secondary dystonias are those that may have other features or may be caused by something uh, where we can identify the cause, like a stroke, for example, or uh, some other kind of brain injury. As we've learned more about genetics, we've learned more and more about what the causes are. And so what we used to call primary or idiopathic, which means I don't know, uh, now we know the causes of many of these. And so uh, the more recent classification system has gotten rid of that distinction. And we'll talk about that just a little bit. So different causes of dystonia, different forms of dystonia vary in ways uh, so that if we can identify some of these features, it helps us consider which diagnoses are possible and which ones are very unlikely. So the age at which the dystonia starts is very important. Those uh, disorders that start in infancy are quite different from those that start in late adulthood, for example. And those that start in the first decade of life, so in childhood up to adolescence, 
um, are different in some ways from those that start during the adolescent years. And they are different in some ways from dystonias that start during adulthood, though there is also some overlap. So some uh, types of dystonia may start any time between, say, 3 and 30 or 40 years of age. And then we want to know what part of the body is involved. Is it focal? Is it just one body part? Is it adjacent body parts, what we often call segmental? Or is it generalized? Does it involve uh, the whole body? Does it involve arms and legs? Or does it uh, just involve arms and trunks, for example? And is it just on one side of the body, or is it on both sides of the body? Those, again, can help us figure out what the, what the causes, what the potential causes are. And a big part of the diagnosis when we're thinking about this is to eliminate things that we think are not likely so that we don't waste time and money and anxiety uh, testing for things that are not uh, going to be likely. We want to know about the temporal pattern. Is it a static disease course, meaning did the dystonia start and has it stayed pretty much the same? Or is it progressive? Is it getting worse? What variability is there? Is it only present with certain actions? Is it worse as the day goes on, what we call a diurnal pattern? Is it paroxysmal, which means it occurs in very clear episodes, and then between episodes there's no dystonia? And then we want to know what comes along with it. Are there other movement disorders, or are there other neurologics, uh, or even systemic manifestations? Is there a rash that goes with it? Is there joint pain that goes with it? So all of these things can be very helpful. And then after we classify it, we want to think about what this is. What is causing this? Do we have evidence that there's degeneration of nerve cells? Or has there been structural injury, either from a hemorrhage or a stroke or an infection? But in most forms of dystonia in children and adolescents, there's really no evidence of degeneration or structural lesion, even those uh, forms of dystonia that are associated with what we call cerebral palsy very often uh, uh, imaging studies, brain MRI scan, don't show us clear evidence for a structural lesion. We want to know, is it inherited or was it acquired? So is this based on genetics or was there an infection or is there a toxin or was there a tumor that caused this? And then we still have what we call idiopathic, mean, meaning we don't really know what caused this. And there are some things that are sporadic uh, again, that are very hard to pin down. Once we've made those determinations of what we're thinking about, um, then the question is, what are the appropriate diagnostic tests to, to order? Uh, I think the important thing is one size doesn't fit all. So just because someone has dystonia does not mean that there is a one specific test or even ten specific tests that should be done. It depends very much on all the things I've already talked about. When did it start? What parts of the body are affected? Is there a family history? We may look, uh, we may do blood tests that look for specific chemical disturbances. Uh, simple things, sodium, calcium abnormalities can sometimes lead to dystonia. There are some genetic tests, more than ever it seems, and we'll talk about a couple of those. Um, and then uh, an MRI scan of the brain uh, may be ordered in some, but not all cases. And in some cases, we may want to get an MRI scan of the spinal cord. Particularly in younger children, uh, where we're considering certain metabolic causes, a spinal tap may be uh, necessary to look at specific chemicals in the spinal fluid, particularly what the chemicals we call neurotransmitters, that can help lead to a very specific diagnosis. And then in some specific situations, there might be other tests that we might want to order, including certain biopsies, including certain other kinds of tests to help us figure out you know, what the cause is. Why do we want to know the cause? Well, the most important reason we want to know the cause is sometimes the cause tells us best how to treat it. And so uh, we'll talk about uh, possible causes. It used to be, so when I started giving lectures about dystonia, this list of different genes associated with dystonia was about, oh, eight or nine items long. As I'll show you now, it's about 25 items long. What I've shown you here in the left column, uh, the classification scheme we call the DYT or DIT classification scheme. So DYT1, these are numbered in order of their naming. 
Uh, many of the dystonias have a specific name. So DYT1 was first described by Dr. Oppenheim, and sometimes it's called Oppenheim's dystonia. Um, and then the, what's the protein involved? Every gene codes for a particular protein, and sometimes uh, we know what that protein does. And uh, as uh, we have learned more and more, you'll see most of these boxes have something in them besides the word unknown. Five years ago, most of these boxes were unknown. And so uh, we're learning a lot in a very rapid uh, fashion about the different causes of dystonia and what the underlying uh, biochemistry is. What I've highlighted in yellow here are the types of dystonia that start in childhood or adolescence. And so what you'll see of the first 10 here on the list, all but two start in childhood or adolescence. Here's the next page, DYT11 through DYT20. Now some of these, as we've learned more about what the genes are, we find that they're really the same as another one we've already uh, numbered, but the numbering scheme uh, main is maintained here. Again, the ones in yellow are the ones that start in childhood, and what you'll see uh, is for most of these, we know what the protein is, um, though the, the newer ones, we're less likely to know that uh, uh, because we're still early in discovery. And then finally, DYT21 through 25, uh, these are mostly adult onset dystonias, but again, we're, we're getting a pretty good idea of what some of the proteins are. So that's 25 of them. That's what uh, uh, some people will call the short list, and that's because there are many, many, many other causes of dystonia, some of which are genetic, uh, and I've got, uh, I'm not going to focus on the details here. Just notice how long the list is of things that are recessive, meaning that it affects children but not their parents, or dominant, that uh, tends to affect multiple generations in the family. There are X-linked ones, that means it's uh, inherited from the, from the mother, and uh, mitochondrial means uh, it's inherited in a different way, and then there are a variety of non-genetic disorders, but even within these, uh, many forms of what we call cerebral palsy, uh, we're learning have a genetic basis. But uh, inflammatory disorders, infectious disorders, there are certain drugs that can cause dystonia. So these are all the things that we think about when, when thinking about the etiology. And again, etiology, the cause of dystonia, is very important because if we determine that it's because of a medication the child is taking, uh, then if we stop the medication, the dystonia should get better. If we determine it's due to uh, a stroke, for example, that will uh, provide us with uh, helpful information about how best to care for the individual with the dystonia. So I'm going to show you a couple more videos. This is a 16-year-old man who has a, a very special form of dystonia. This is called dopa-responsive dystonia. And the reason this is kind of a special form is because it's one of the forms of dystonia that really responds dramatically to treatment. Unfortunately, this is not a common cause of dystonia. Otherwise, uh, 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 well, most forms of dystonia are much harder to treat than this. But this also provides an example of how disabling this can be. Notice the, uh, the twisting here of the ankles. It's hard for him to get up out of the chair, hard for him to bear weight. And once he's up, You'll see in a moment it requires his father to come. He'll have to sit down again, and his father will have to come help him stand up. Notice the twisting, not just of the legs, but of the arms and of the trunk. One of the surprising things, perhaps, is looking at how twisted his ankles are. He has no pain associated with this. It causes a lot of disability, but actually this doesn't cause much pain for him. And he's been, he's 16, he's been using the wheelchair now for about uh, nine or ten months as this has gotten worse. So that was the day that uh, we suspected that he had dopa responsive dystonia. This is a month later after uh, he received treatment with um, uh, a medication called levodopa. And you can see how much better he is just after taking this medication for a very short period of time. And this is a condition that most neurologists will want to consider in any child who has dystonia, 
again, because it's, it's one of the ones that we can treat most successfully. Now, how do we treat dystonia? Well, it depends in part on cause. A child or adolescent who has dopa responsive dystonia, we know exactly how to treat that. For many other forms of dystonia, uh, we have other treatments that can be helpful, but they're um, more likely to be partially effective. Children and adults are different, and children with dystonia are more likely to have other kinds of movement disorders in addition to the dystonia than our adults. It's said that children can often tolerate higher doses of medicine for dystonia than can adults, but we're starting to learn that that may not be true. Uh, the distinction actually may be that adults are more likely to complain when they have side effects, and children are less likely to complain when they have side effects, even though they're having significant side effects. And so we're becoming increasingly sensitive to the possibility that children are having side effects from medications, even though they're not telling us about it. Um, botulinum toxin is the mainstay of treatment for adult dystonias, but it plays a smaller role for treatment of dystonia in children for a variety of reasons. So what are our treatment options? Well, oral medications, and I'll talk about a couple of those. Uh, botulinum toxin injections, uh, Botox, Dysport, Myoblock are all different brands of botulinum toxin. There's something called intrathecal baclofen. So most of the time we give baclofen by mouth, but there is a pump and a catheter that can be implanted to, live, to deliver it directly to the spinal cord. And then there's neurosurgery. You can either destroy part of the brain, what we call ablative neurosurgery, or you can put in deep brain stimulating electrodes and the, the batteries that, uh, that power them. And then there are adaptive strategies, and I'm going to talk about each of these. So oral medications, we don't have a lot. There are several that are used very commonly. I mentioned carbidopa and levodopa, a brand name of Cinemat, at least in North America. This is usually our first choice unless we know what the cause is and know that it's not dopa-responsive dystonia. Some people, even if they don't have dopa-responsive dystonia, may have benefit from carbidopa and levodopa, even, again, if they don't have a dopamine deficiency. Trihexyphenidyl, a uh, brand name is Artane, and this long name is why most of us call it Artane, uh, is the medicine for which we have the best research evidence for it being effective. Uh, there are some uh, studies that were done now almost 30 years ago that showed um, uh, Artane, trihexyphenidyl, to be more effective than placebo in children and young adults with dystonia. It may take very high doses, and we generally increase this very slowly, so it may take several months to get to a dose of this medicine before we can judge whether it's effective or not. And to make it even trickier, sometimes we'll get to a dose and we won't see a full uh, benefit or full response to that dose for several weeks. And so it takes careful uh, adjustment and close contact between the families and the physicians uh, to make sure that uh, uh, the response is understood and to make sure that, uh, again, there's good communication as this medication is being adjusted. And then baclofen is the other one that's most commonly used. Sometimes it's used in combination with Artane, sometimes it's used alone. There are some studies that show that it may be more effective if the dystonia causes pain than for painless dystonia, but we don't know that for sure. And then some people will go on to get baclofen pumps though it's my general advice that a, a good trial of baclofen by mouth should be tried before a, a surgical pump is implanted. And then there are other medications that may be effective in some cases. And uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to list all of them, but uh, there are several other medicines that have been effective for some people. What about botulinum toxin or Botox? That's injected directly into the muscles, and it affects the muscle in which it's injected. And so if you have 35 muscles affected by dystonia, you can't inject all those muscles. And so the benefit from Botox um, uh, depends really on how many muscles are causing problems. We're limited in total dose based on body size. So a full-grown adult can receive more botulinum toxin than can a two- or three-year-old, for example. And typically involves multiple injections, which is another reason why it's used less in children than in adults, because children tend not to like to have multiple needle sticks every three to four months. But 
Uh, we can do it with sedation. We can do it with a lot of reassurance. And there are some children who do get injections uh, three or four times a year. The benefit is temporary. Uh, and then it has to be repeated. So again, on average, every three or four, some people can go up to six months. Intrathecal baclofen, I mentioned, this involves surgical implantation of a pump with a catheter that goes into a space around the spinal cord. And this allows one to in directly infuse baclofen into the spinal fluid. Why would someone want to do this? Well, one of the major side effects of baclofen is sedation. And that's when baclofen works in the brain. And so if you have benefit from baclofen, but it causes excessive sedation, one option is to deliver it directly to the spinal cord, get very little into the brain, and have less sedation. However, anytime you do surgery, there's a potential risk of complications from that surgery. And in this case, meningitis is a risk occurring in up to 10% of uh, children who have had the pump placed. The benefit in dystonia is highly variable, and it may depend on the underlying cause. Children with cerebral palsy who often have a mixed movement disorder are probably more likely to benefit from this than are uh, individuals who have genetic dystonias. And we don't really know. There are some people who say that it's beneficial even when oral baclofen doesn't provide benefit, uh, but there's not a lot of experience and a lot, not a lot of research on comparing the two. What about adaptive strategies? Well, what's an adaptive strategy? A lot of it is behavior change. Um, because dystonia can be task specific, uh, those who have trouble writing but not with typing, well, then you type more than you write. Uh, I know children who have trouble walking, but they run more easily, and they often will run to get around. Uh, sometimes identifying particular sensory tricks that can help relieve the muscle contraction uh, can be helpful, though most of the time it's the patient uh, himself or herself who identifies the tricks rather than uh, a therapist or a parent. Physical occupational speech therapy can be very, imp uh, very important. It can be very helpful in some cases. In other cases, it provides uh, encouragement to maintain physical activity, which is a good thing for everybody. Uh, there's not a lot of research on efficacy for these things in most forms of dystonia, but there's lots of experience that, uh, that people move more easily or they feel less tight uh, after participating in, uh, in therapy. And sometimes it involves re retraining, and sometimes it involves uh, training uh, how to relax. And then adaptive devices can sometimes be used, including adaptive devices that change the size or the shape of a pen or a fork. Uh, to provide some benefit um, through mechanisms we don't fully understand. And then finally, there's deep brain stimulation. Uh, deep brain stimulation is something that is increasingly used for treating dystonia, particularly in children, and particularly for the genetic dystonias, though it's not uniformly effective. Uh, there are some forms of secondary dystonia where uh, it provides benefits. Some of the degenerative diseases can uh, benefit from this in, uh, in some patients. In the most common uh, form of dystonia in children, and that's uh, dystonia that occurs with cerebral palsy, there's less good evidence. Some seem to benefit more than others. There are some children who benefit with reduction of pain and discomfort, but don't have much functional improvement. And so we're still learning a lot about deep brain stimulation for treatment of dystonia. The other thing is we think that deep brain stimulation helps by changing um, plasticity in the brain, changing how the brain adapts to uh, different levels of, levels of activity. And during childhood and adolescence, there's a lot of plasticity involved in learning. So we don't really know what the long-term effects are in uh, when young children have the deep brain stimulation started. But we've been, we collectively have been doing this now uh, in dystonia for a good 15 years or so. And there doesn't seem to be any uh, substantial long-term risk uh, when, it's, uh, when it's done in young children. But again, we don't fully know the effect on the developing brain. Let me show you just a little bit of data. Uh, this is a graph on the uh, vertical axis here, on the y-axis here is what's called the Burke von Marsden dystonia rating scale. Zero is no problems, and 120 is the worst, is the highest score one can get for dystonia. And here are two groups, uh, one group that has uh, a mutation in the DYT1 gene, 
and this group does not. And this is the score, the white bars are scored before deep brain stimulation, and the gray bars are the scores after deep brain stimulation. And what you'll see is regardless of whether the person has a, a DYT1 mutation or not, there's substantial benefit in the majority, but not everyone, uh, but the majority of patients with uh, dystonia to deep brain stimulation. And so let me show you a video of that. This is a young man who has DYT1 dystonia, so he has a genetic form of dystonia. And you can see that he has dystonia involving his trunk and his neck and his limbs. He has a fair amount of tremor associated with his dystonia. And here he's just being asked to touch uh, the examiner's finger and touch his nose. You can see his movements are pretty quick. But as he's doing that, he gets more and more twisting of his, uh, um, of his trunk. And you can see he has quite a bit of difficulty walking. He's trying to stand up uh, straighter now. What I want to see now is can you turn just to face that door over there? And I'm going to skip ahead here to uh, later. So this is six weeks after the uh, stimulators were turned on. Now here's six months later. So it takes a while to program these, and it takes a while to see maximum benefit. But you can see now six months later, he's dramatically better. He still has some dystonia. You can see it a little more on the left than on the right. His shaking, his tremor has gotten better. That's fantastic. In a moment, we'll see him get up and walk. Movements are still uh, quite accurate, but you can see that he doesn't have the twisting of his neck or twisting of his trunk when he's doing this uh, uh, rapid touching of the finger in his nose. So the good news is that sometimes this can be dramatically effective to the point where some people have benefit to, uh, where they look like they don't have any dystonia left at all. The bad news is not everybody benefits from this, and there are many children with uh, dystonia, pretty severe dystonia, who have little or no benefit from this. So we're still trying to learn a lot about how to, how to make this kind of therapy more consistently effective and how to figure out who are the people who are most likely to benefit uh, versus those who aren't. So before going to questions, let me just summarize. I think it's an exciting time for uh, those of us who are interested in dystonia because we're learning so much so rapidly. Uh, we're really making, I think, incredible progress towards understanding what causes dystonia, uh, with new causes being identified, and as those causes are identified, it leads to ideas about new uh, potential treatments. Even though there may be a hundred different causes of dystonia, uh, different dystonias may respond to very similar treatments. And although we still have our mainstay medications of uh, artane and baclofen and botulinum toxin, we have some newer uh, potential medications that, that are um, providing benefit for some individuals. And then finally, deep brain stimulation, I think, is increasingly a promising option for specific types of dystonia, and maybe ultimately for many other types of dystonia as we learn more. Uh, it seems to be effective in uh, young children, uh, as young as there are some people who have done this in the children as young as three or four years of age, uh, but children and adolescents seem to actually benefit from deep brain stimulation more than older adults. So why don't I stop here, and uh, we can go to some questions. Great. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Mink. Uh, so the first question we have tonight is: is one week uh, is a one week trial of L-DOPA uh, a long enough time to reject dopa responsive dystonia as a diagnosis? Uh, the simple answer is no. The longer answer is it's not so much how long someone is on the medication, but it's a factor of how high the dose gets. 
Now, there are some children, well, most people, you have to start at a lower dose and then gradually increase the dose. But uh, most children will not get to a dose high enough to say they've had an adequate trial in a week. Okay. Next question is, what's the youngest age um, of a child uh, that can have botulinum toxin injections? And are there any special um, contraindications for children? Right. So the youngest age, there is no actual youngest age. Um, I know, uh, but most children uh, don't have uh, impairment from their dystonia enough to warrant treatment generally in the first year or two of their life. But I do know some children who have had injections as, as young as 18 months. Um, the main limitation is the weight of the child. And so the dosing guidelines are in terms of units per kilogram of body weight. Uh, and, and so the main limitation is not the age of the child, but is the overall size of the child. Um, are there any particular contraindications? Well, it's something where, where um, it, I think the main thing is, is uh, this has to be done in an appropriate way. Uh, botulinum toxin is the toxin that causes botulism, which can be, uh, can, uh, be life-threatening. And so uh, certainly this needs to be done by people who are experienced with it and in doses that are appropriate for the size of the, of the child. Other than that, there are very few allergies that have been reported with this. The main side effect is weakness. Um, and often there's trial and error to find just the right dose in the right muscles for the individual who's ha who is being treated with botulinum toxin. But otherwise, it, it, in general, it's quite safe and very well tolerated in the doses that are usually used. Great, thank you. So we have a couple questions about dystonia and cerebral palsy. Uh, can you explain in more detail the link between cerebral palsy and dystonia? And then a follow-up with that is, what is known about the effectiveness of DBS for children who also have cerebral palsy? Yes. So the first one, cerebral palsy is a term that refers to any motor disorder, any disorder of movement starting early in life, generally starting in the first year of life, that is not progressive, meaning that the underlying cause is usually uh, a brain injury, a stroke, uh, oxygen deprivation. Usually something has happened. The cause uh, of that is over and done with, and then one is left with the consequences of that injury. Um, and so it's not something that gets worse over time, though the symptoms can change over time. The most common type of cerebral palsy is something that's called spastic cerebral palsy, something that causes weakness and tightness. Dystonic cerebral palsy, I would say somewhere between oh, 40 and 60 percent of children with any kind of cerebral palsy have some dystonia, and probably about 20 to 30 percent have mostly dystonia. So dystonia is a symptom, this twisting posture, the abnormal movement with overflow, and so a good proportion of children have cerebral, with cerebral palsy have some dystonia, but not every child with uh, cerebral palsy has dystonia. So what about deep brain stimulation? There have been a few trials in children. Uh, the best trial was done in young adults and older adolescents who have cerebral palsy, and from that we learned it's not as effective as it is in genetic dystonias, but it seems that people who had the surgery at younger ages, meaning as teenagers, uh, did better than those who had the surgery when they were in their 40s or 50s. There is uh, some experience in very young children. Uh, there's one person in particular in the United Kingdom who has a large uh, clinic where they've uh, put deep brain stimulating electrodes in children as young as three years of age. And in the most severely affected children, their results tell us that it uh, tends to reduce pain and discomfort. Uh, it's still not clear which children, if any children with cerebral palsy with dystonia, have much functional benefit, meaning can they do things now that they couldn't do before. Uh, there are children who have had functional benefit, but it's still uh, very early in the research in this area. Um, and so my general recommendation is that if someone is interested in or wants to learn more about deep brain stimulation for dystonic cerebral palsy, it's best to go to a center where they have uh, a fair amount of experience with deep brain stimulation in children. 
Okay, great, thank you. Uh, do you have any data on the responsiveness of DYT11 to DBS? No. Um, it has been used in individuals with DYT11, uh, but it is, um, uh, for each individual form of dystonia, we don't have a lot of um, data to tell us whether certain forms of dystonia respond better to, um, to DBS than others. And just like uh, um, you know, any therapy, it takes a little while, uh, a little bit, um, it takes you know, a while to figure out not just whether it's effective or not, but whether the device has to be programmed in a different way for some forms of dystonia than for others. Again, there have been some small studies reported in DYT11, which is otherwise known as myoclonus dystonia syndrome. Um, and there are reports of individuals who have had benefit but there are also reports of individuals who have had less benefit than expected. And we don't know if that's because of the site of the surgery, if it's because of the programming, or if it's something about the underlying disease. Great, thanks. Can children take tetrabenazine? Yes, so I didn't mention tetrabenazine. Uh, tetrabenazine is one of those medicines I alluded to that's a relatively newer one, at least in the United States. Um, where in some individuals they do seem to benefit from tetrabenazine. So tetrabenazine is a medication that depletes dopamine. In most forms of dystonia, it seems that actually augmenting or giving additional dopamine may help. But in some people, uh, taking the dopamine away uh, can help. And there's not a lot of uh, uh, research that's been done on tetrabenazine in uh, children with dystonia or even in adults with dystonia. There are some reports of very good benefit, and then there are reports of no benefit. But it's a reasonable thing to consider uh, if other more commonly used medications have not provided benefit. Okay, great. Is there any evidence to suggest that kids pr uh, progress faster, uh, their dystonia progresses faster during adolescence? There's no evidence that adolescence itself makes things progress faster. But there are many forms of dystonia where the earliest symptoms occur in children who are 9, 10, 11 years old, and then the symptoms progress over four, five, six years. And so it's unclear if it's just that the disorder, that the severity of the dystonia progresses over four or five years, or if the adolescence itself, uh, hormonal changes, brain development changes, play a role in that. But for the great majority of the types of dystonia that we see that start in children or young adolescents, we don't think there's a particular role of puberty or of other growth changes that occur in adolescence that make things worse. Okay. Um, what, what causes and how would you treat torticollis in infants? Ah, nice question. So there are two types of torticollis. Uh, there's something called congenital torticollis, and that is generally due to um, the position the baby was in the uterus, where there gets to be some tightness of one of the uh, muscles in the neck called the sternocleidomastoid. And when that muscle gets tight, uh, it tends to turn the head to one side and pull the ear down towards the shoulder. This is not a dystonia, but this is a, a an abnormality due to kind of the baby getting cramped inside the womb. And so that's treated with physical therapy, and over time uh, that usually resolves. There are other disorders that are more like dystonia that are due to abnormal muscle contraction that occur, can occur, usually not in infants. They usually don't start till about six months of age or later. And there are a variety of things uh, that can cause uh, uh, torticollis or neck twisting in babies, some of which are best thought of as a form of dystonia. Others may be a form of migraine. Okay, and um, uh, what is uh, genome sequencing and when is it appropriate for a family to consider? Uh -huh. So um, a lot of the genetic testing that we've done historically for dystonia has been focused on one, two, maybe three genes. At one point, we only had one gene we knew about, and we could test for that. And now we have a lot of genes we know about, and we can test for some of them commercially, meaning there's a lab out there that will do this for a fee. Others can be tested for on a research basis. But it, 
basically means testing for each gene independently. If I have a patient, for example, that I think is highly likely to have DYT1, I may just send testing for DYT1. There are newer methods um, to look at large parts of the DNA. So uh, genome-wide means across all of the uh, uh, DNA. There's something called whole exome sequencing, which looks at just the parts of DNA that code for particular proteins. But this is a, a method where you can look for many, many genes all at the same time. Uh, the price of this is coming down so that uh, very soon uh, it will be cheaper to do a genome-wide uh, screen or a whole exome sequencing screen than to look for just one gene. However, we still, our, our technology, our ability to test for many genes is exceeding our ability to uh, understand what some of these things mean. So very often when doing that type of testing, the result is that there were five or six variants that were found of unknown significance. So if it makes a specific diagnosis, if you suspect uh, a genetic form of dystonia and you get a result with a mutation in, let's say, DYT12 uh, locus, then you say, aha, that fits. But if you get a report back that says, oh, there are four variations of unknown significance, well, that's exactly that. We don't know whether that is, has anything to do with the dystonia or not. Um, and so our ability to find these changes is greater than our ability to interpret them sometimes. But I expect, and I think most geneticists and neurologists expect, within the next oh, five or six years, this is going to be a pretty standard test in our, uh, in our toolbox. And again, if, if you know, I suspected that someone had myoclonus dystonia syndrome or DYT11, I would just test for that one thing because it wouldn't give me a lot of information I, I wouldn't know how to do with, uh, deal with. But the fact of the matter is in many children with dystonia, after extensive testing, we still don't know why. And in those situations, a gene chip or whole exome or, or genome-wide sequencing uh, is a potential, po potentially powerful option. What's the maximum, when you're trying to find the right dose of cinnamon, what, what is the maximum dose that you would use uh, for generally, a Yeah, generally based on weight, weight, the maximum I would use is generally, so cinnamon comes, it's got two components. There's carbidopa and there's levodopa, and usually it's expressed as a ratio. So it's cinnamon 25 slash 100, for example. The first number is the carbidopa, and that's there to help prevent nausea and vomiting. Uh, as a side effect from the levodopa, and the second number is the levodopa. I generally recommend, as do other experts, uh, to go as high as 10 milligrams per kilogram per day uh, before uh, giving up. Now, some children uh, will have benefit at a much lower dose, but there are uh, some children that uh, don't have benefit until they get up to that high of a dose. So generally, 10 milligrams per kilogram per day is a maximum dose uh, and usually we divide that into three times a day dosing. Great. And do you have recommendations for treating pain in children and for treating children who have s trouble sleeping? Yes. So um, pain in children um, is tricky. And it's tricky because there are some children who probably have substantial pain and they don't have the verbal ability to tell us about it. There are other children who are either uncomfortable or having difficulty for other reasons, and they use words like pain to describe something that's really more frustration. Uh, if, the, if a child has pain that's caused by the dystonia, my first approach would be try, to try to decrease the dystonia, try to decrease the cause of the pain. But in children who have substantial pain, uh, and other efforts are not effective, then targeting the pain primarily. And that can involve medication, it can involve uh, physical therapy, it can sometimes involve uh, relaxation exercises. And what was the second part of the question, Janet? Recommendations for uh, kids who have trouble sleeping. Yes, recommendations for kids who have trouble sleeping. And that is uh, a common problem regardless, but children who have neurologic problems often have trouble sleeping. Um, my first recommendation is, uh, that, that sleep is a learned behavior and to make sure that 
bedtime routine, make sure that the sleep routine is predictable and consistent from night to night, from setting to setting. So if a child is with grandma two nights a week and another place, to make sure that the bedtime routine is exactly the same. There are some medicines that can help. Melatonin, which is a naturally occurring um, hormone that is involved in sleep, is available uh, and can be very be beneficial in some children. There are other children where other sleep aids can be helpful, but often, uh, you know, if dystonia is an impediment to falling asleep, the best thing to do is to try to help with the dystonia rather than giving a medication to make kids sleepy. Okay, great. Uh, just a couple more questions. Um, the, can you address uh, the benefit of DBS for treating um, laryngeal dystonia uh, and, uh, and or um, tongue? Yeah, that's a really good question. That's a question that I'm asking myself a lot these days because, uh, first of all, um, in most childhood onset dystonias, laryngeal, so voice involvement and tongue involvement are is uncommon. But when it happens, it can be very disabling. Uh, so things that interfere with one's ability to, to talk to communicate can cause much more disability than uh, things that interfere with writing or walking, for example. Um, deep brain stimulation is usually targeting a part of the brain called the globus pallidus internal segment, and that's a part of the brain where the body below the neck is represented, and there's another part of, it's got a cousin where the body above the neck is represented, and so we don't have as much success with uh, GPI deep brain stimulation as we, uh, for the neck and above as we do for others. Botulinum toxin injections can be helpful um, and DBS may be helpful in some people but we don't, if that's the primary problem, I'm a little less likely to say this, is, uh, this has a, a substantial uh, chance of providing benefit. But we're learning more and it may be if we were to have this discussion in two years we'll have enough information to, to tell you really what the likelihood is. And um, have the rechargeable batteries been approved for uh, kids with dystonia? Rechargeable batteries are available. They are used in some kids with dystonia. Um, they are good in some settings and bad in other settings. Um, I've not, I don't have any personal experience with the rechargeable batteries. Colleagues of mine who have patients who have had the rechargeable batteries, they're bigger devices and so they're tougher to put in the smaller children. Uh, but for children who use a very high um, uh, setting that causes a fast drain in the battery, it does uh, uh, result in fewer surgeries. And so it's, um, uh, it is used in children. Is it approved? Uh, dystonia, DBS for dystonia right now, the FDA uh, uh, has approved this under a humanitarian device exemption, uh, but that's not specific for the individual um, a pulse generator. Um, that's really for the procedure itself. Um, last question. What's been um, found to be the best treatment for myoclonus dystonia? That is a good question. Um, you know, the, the problem with a lot of uh, these rarer forms of disorders is we don't have the, the gold standard placebo controlled trials to find out what's better than sugar pill. Um, some individuals have good response to one type of treatment and not to others. Uh, for myoclonus dystonia, it probably depends in part on whether the bigger problem is the myoclonus, the big muscle jerks, or whether it's the dystonia. Uh, for dystonia, it seems to be about the same as the others that I've talked about. For the myoclonus, there may be some medications that are affected primarily in myoclonus that may provide some benefit. And again, there are some people who've had benefit from deep brain stimulation. But uh, the, we're less likely in that condition to be able to, uh, to predict in advance which specific medication is likely to help. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mink, for this wonderful uh, information. Um, it's really been just terrific. And, and, and everyone, for your great questions, um, we will work to get answers to these other questions that we didn't have time to address and, and get them out to everybody. So um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. We wish you a good night and um, look for information on future webinars. Thank you. Good night.